privilege and the grace it is to be able to, to go to our Lord in prayer. To know that we have a God that we can come to. That we can talk with about anything. And uh, that we're going to be looking today at uh, an instance of two people praying. We're gonna, as we turn to the book of Luke again, uh, and if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and flip over to Luke 18. And we're going to look at two people praying and what Jesus has to say about that. And so we'll talk about that and, and explore and learn how to pray and what that reveals about who we are. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, if you're visiting with us, uh, please feel free to fill out a visitor's tab. There should be some visitor's tab on the back table back there. If not, you can come see me and I can get you one. We'd love to find out more about you and how we can uh, minister to you and your family and, uh, and help you grow in, in knowing who God is and how He can impact your life. Also, I wanted to uh, mention, normally we, we pray for other churches here in Georgetown. Uh, today I want to take time, everyone is, I'm sure, aware of you know what's been happening in France with the, the terrorist attack there and, and just the hurt uh, of so many people losing loved ones and, and um, people they know and just unimaginable horror. Of, of the mass attacks, but if you recall, uh, this summer we had uh, some friends of mine who were missionaries in France who came and spoke on a Sunday evening to us, and they are back over in France now, and they're not in Paris, but um, they are in that country, and uh, you know, I put on Facebook yesterday, some of y'all might have seen, you know, praying for France and praying for my friends who are over there, because I believe God has put them in that country at this time to, to minister to those people, because this attack doesn't just affect the people in Paris. Right? It's affecting everybody in that country. Just like September 11th, you know, we were in Kentucky, and yet we felt the weight of what was happening in New York on us. And so those people need a message of hope, and the people of France are vastly far from God. So I put on Facebook, uh, you know, praying for my friends who are missionaries to France, and literally like five minutes later, I got a text from France from our friends saying, please don't use the word missionary. Can you change that? Because the, the, the government and the people of France are, are so like anti-missionary, anti-Christian missionaries. He said, that, you know, change it to Christian worker, change it to something, but, but you know, don't use the word missionary. So that's just a picture of where that country is right now, how far they are from God. And yet, you know, I believe God can use something as tragic as this event this week to open the eyes of the people there to the truth and the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ because sometimes it takes things like this to see our need, to see the need for hope. And so let's pray for France, let's pray for the Harrington family as they seek to, to be faithful ministers of God's word and God's hope to these people. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for opportunity to sing together, to worship together. Lord, we know that Christianity, that the Christian life, was not meant to be lived in isolation. You have brought together a, a people who all love you, who have the, the same desires, the same goals in life because of your presence in our life. And so we can come together as a body and worship you and strive together and help each other. And that's what we are here for today. To, to hear from you and to encourage one another in the faith. Father, I do want to pray for the country of France this morning, Lord, with the, the tragedy that's happened there with the terrorist attacks and, and many who have lost their lives. Uh, Lord, we do pray for those families that have, lo have lost loved ones. But, but more than that, Father, we pray that you would use this tragedy to bring hope out of the ashes, that you would... Show that you are a God who can redeem even the, the most evil things in this world and bring good out of it. And we pray that the good that would come out of this would be people who, whose eyes are opened to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they would hear the good news of a God who in the end will overcome all evil. And that they can now know this God and, and experience life with Him. Lord, I pray for the, the Harrington family as they have been placed by you in that country at this time, moment in history, Lord, that you would use them to, to share the hope of you with the people that they come into contact with. Give them opportunities, sovereign, divine appointments to, to speak with those people. And now, Lord, as we 
look at your word together and study it together. Lord, may we see you uh, in, in our lives. May we see you at work in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> You know, uh, I don't know if you all knew it or not, but Georgetown, Kentucky, I think would be considered the Bible Belt. You know, and if you've been in Georgetown long, it doesn't take too too long to notice. There's a lot of churches and a lot of buildings and religious things going on in Georgetown and Lexington and in this area of the country. Um, but one thing, you know, that, that's a good thing. I, I think it's good to have exposure to the Bible and, and kind of that history. But there's also a, a real kind of a challenge that comes with that. And, and for me as a pastor, one of my fears is that because we live in the Bible Belt, because we are, have so much exposure to Christianity, that there, there's probably a lot of people who consider themselves Christians, believers in Jesus, uh, because they've done certain things. They've made, made, maybe made an external profession of faith, uh, walked an aisle, been baptized, uh, prayed the sinner's prayer, uh, you know, you, you all have probably seen that where somebody's up here, pray this prayer and you're, you'll be good. All right? Uh, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. And, and so they've done all these things, but it's just things they've done. It, it's, it's not uh, coming from who they are, from, from the inside of their heart. And so I, I'm afraid that there's many people who, who think they're Christians when, and, and they've done all these things, and yet in reality their lives look anything like Christian lives. And, and so the Bible tells us, look, if you are a follower of Jesus, your life is radically changed. Your life will be different. You will be transformed. It doesn't all happen immediately, but you will be on this path of a changed life. You know, maybe these people have, have gone to church camp and, and walked forward with, you know, an invitation. Maybe they had their friend or their family member walk forward and they went down with them. I know a lot of people who've, who've done that, and then later on in life, rethought things. Maybe, maybe I didn't really know what was going on. I just kind of got caught up in the moment. <clears throat> but the, the truth is, if we are followers of Christ, we will have a transformation. And so you ask those people, you know, are you a Christian? And a lot of times the answer you get is, yes, I believe in God, or, or yes, I go to church twice a month. Uh, and, and you're like, that's not really what I asked. You know, not where do you go? What do you do? Are you a Christian? And so we have to realize, and I think what God wants us to realize today is, that's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity, in reality, is, a, is about a total dependence on God in our life. <coughs> it's about a, a recognition of our need for Him, and then a, an outward living as a result of that. Jesus has a word for us today as people who live in the Bible Belt, people who have been exposed and seen church buildings all the time, been around church people um, all the time. Jesus has a word for us because that's where he lived. He lived in Israel, in Jerusalem, the place of God's people, God's chosen people. There were temples. There was the temple around them where everybody went and worshipped. The vast majority of the people in that country were considered themselves godly people. They considered themselves good Jews. And so this, these were the people that Jesus interacted with and talked with on a daily basis. And that's, that's who he's talking with in this passage today as we read it together. And so kind of put yourselves in, in the shoes of these people he's talking with because we have a, a, very, a lot of similarities to the Jewish people in Israel here in, here in Georgetown, Kentucky. So let's read this together and... As we do, let's think about some, some things that mark genuine worshipers of God, true people of God. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 18, 9 through 14. And if you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the, the screens with us here. Let me read that for us. And this is Jesus speaking. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple com complex to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand and was praying like this, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. So let, let's stop here. 
First of all, notice that, that Jesus is not a coward here. He's talking straight to these people. These people who, who, who have something wrong, something that needs to be addressed in real life. He's not talking about them. He's talking directly to them. You know, how often do we when, we, when we see something that's not right, we don't go to those people, right? We, we make a comment off to the side. Hey, did you see what, what that person did over there? That is, that's not right. They shouldn't have done that. Instead of going to them, hey, I see this in you. I'm concerned about you. There's something that needs to be done here. And so Jesus just shoots straight with them. You know, he doesn't pull any punches. And he's talking to church people. He's talking to religious people who are trying to be righteous themselves. And he, he tells this parable, this story, to kind of highlight his point. And the story is about prayer. You know, we sang this song about prayer, take everything to God in prayer. Well, how we pray, and, and, and what he wants, is trying to point out, is how we pray gives a real indicator to where we stand with God. It, it gives insight into our hearts. And so the first, as we just read, he, he brings up this Pharisee, the people that he's talking with. And this re, with religious person is at the, the temple complex, and he's with all the other religious people around him. And so put yourself here in this moment for a minute. Th think about what this guy's doing. Now, for us, we think we're doing, we're doing good if we come to church on Sunday mornings once a week. All right? We're, we're, we're good. We're, we're doing the Christian life. We're, we're doing the God thing. Well, their custom in Israel wasn't once a week. It was twice a day. And so there was, there was two periods a day, 9 a.m., 3 p.m., where the people gathered at the temple to pray, to burn incense as worship, to... Uh, have a priestly benediction, basically where the priest would come out and pray over them twice a day. I mean, you're interrupting your schedules on a daily basis. And so he begins, he's a committed guy, he begins this prayer, thanking God he is not like these sinful people who don't do these things. All right, that, That's where he is, that he's able to do these good things. Now, on the surface, this, this looks like a good thing. God, I thank you. He's, he's acknowledging God. That God has some part, some role in him being there. But in reality, he's not really thanking God. He's thanking himself. And so look what he does. It says he fasts twice a week. Fasting is where you go a period of time without eating, eating food, and it's meant to kind of show that your desire is for God and not for food. And so the, in the Jewish culture, there's only one required fast. One day of the year, the Day of Atonement, the people were required to fast. This guy fasts twice a week, way above what's required. And then tithing. You know, we just had an offering here where we give money to support the work that God is doing. In, in the Old Testament, Jews were required to tithe a tenth of all they had. And so uh, this guy does this, but he goes beyond that. Not only does he give a tenth of what, he's, what he has... He gives a tenth of everything that he's purchased. This would be like us tithing on our tax refund. So we tithe on our taxes when we pay, or on our income when we first get it. Then we get money back and we tithe on it again. That, that's what he's doing here. He's tithing on purchases that have already been tithed on. So he's, he's extra committed. He's given extra money. And yet, um, this guy, while his whole life is about religion and showing that his commitment to God and accomplishing all these things, he's trying to remind God what he has done for him. He's saying, God, look, look at how good I am. Look, look at what I've done for you. So then Jesus shifts to the other guy in the story. Let's read verse 13 together. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, turn your wrath from me, a sinner pretty different picture, right, of these two guys. He has nothing to say to God. God, I've done nothing for you. Instead, look what he does. And this is a tax collector. You know, he's looked at, and we've talked about tax collectors a little bit here recently. They're immoral, immoral people, people the Jews hated because they, had, uh, they were sellouts, basically. They didn't follow God's law. They you know, followed the Romans and, and tried to get money for themselves. They were greedy, selfish people. And yet something has brought this man to this place, to, to the presence where God is. He knows he needs God. Something's happened. 
So he had to be desperate. But while he's there, he keeps his distance from all these other religious people. He doesn't feel worthy to be around them. All these people have their lives together. I don't. I'm going to keep my distance even though I'm going to be here where God is. And so he, he comes and he just pleads for mercy. He begs for God to help him. For God to withhold the judgment that he deserves. He knows he sinned and he wants out. He wants help. And yet he knows there's nothing he can do. He just lays it before God. That's, that's the second guy. Well, then Jesus kind of sums up the story and he, he gives the lesson. Look at verse 14 together. I tell you, this one, this tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other, rather than the religious man. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a shocking statement. You line up these two guys in front of these people, or in front of us, and you ask, which one of these guys do you think is declared right before God? That's what justified means. How many people of us would point to that tax collector who everybody knows sins on a regular basis? That's his job, to take my money, to steal from me. How many people are going to say he's right with God? No, we would all point to the, the guy who gives all, all, these, all this money to the temple, who, who does all these things, who fasts all these, all these times a week. This, that's the guy who's right with God. But Jesus shocks him. No. In fact, it's the other guy. Why is that? It's because the tax collector humbled himself. This just shows us the value that God places on our hearts, on our motives, on our intentions. It's not about what we do outwardly for other people to see. It's about where we stand with God in our hearts. It's a stark contrast, and it's often different than we think as people. So I want us to, to look at this, this passage together and take a look at our hearts together. We see some things that God wants from us if we want to really be people whose hearts are given to Him. So the first thing we see in this passage as we look at the, the tax collector and the Pharisee is that God wants us to be honest with Him. He wants us to be honest with Him. First, look at the Pharisee. Look at, look at how he's praying and what he says. How he approached God. God, I thank you that I'm not like these people I don't, I'm not greedy, I'm not unrighteous, I'm not an adulterer or even a tax collector. I do all these things. When we look at that prayer and how he approaches God, what comes to your mind? To me, when I, when I read that, it shows me kind of a, a distance. It, it, he's not really pouring out his heart to God or anything like that. It's just kind of a, a distant acknowledgement that God, you're there. I thank you that you've not made me like this. But that's it. I mean, what kind of relationship would that be if we were talking to another person? You don't really know the guy. He's just kind of there. Maybe you all know people like that, where you've been around them a long time, but you don't really know them. You kind of know what they've said about themselves or what they do with their life, but you don't really know them. That's, that's kind of where he stands with God. You get that impression of him. There's no real emotion there's no acknowledgement of any need in his life from, for anything from God. Um, you know, we, we, think, we see people that it looks like they have it all together on the outside. That's kind of the persona they put out. They don't really need anybody else. <coughs> they've got their family. They've got their, their little circle. Their life's together. We're good. And, and same thing with God. People have that relationship with God. You can pick up on it. If you watch people and see how they react and interact with people, and they, it's like they acknowledge God is there, but God, I don't really need you right now. My life's going good. I'll, I'll put you in my back pocket, and when things get a little bit tougher, then I'll, I'll call you. All right? Now I know you're there if I need you, but for now I'm just going to do my thing. You know, I've had conversations with people who've literally told me, I don't really need God in my life right now. 
when, when things change, I'll, you know, I'll reevaluate. But I don't really need God right now. You know, the Pharisee wouldn't say that because he's a religious guy. He knows there's a God. But that's what his prayer, that's what his body language is communicating. God, you've not made me like these sinners. Thank you for where I am. And I'll take it from here. Do you really think that's true in his life, though? Do you really think he has it all together? Does anybody really have it all together? I think sometimes we can kind of deceive ourselves and pull the wool over our eyes and ignore the truth about who we really are because we want to think we have it all together. That's where the Pharisee is. I guarantee you his life wasn't perfect. He had a need for God. And how do we know that? Well, it says right here, he was looking down on other people. Judgmentalism. All right? And so we know he had some, some pride issues in his heart. And yet, he's putting on this outward appearance that he's good. So that's the first guy. Then we look at the second guy. Was he honest with God? Was he ever? All right? His prayer is a lot different. He knows that he has problems. He has issues. He knows who he's talking to. It is God who's way up here, and he sees himself way down here. Not even worthy to say a word to him. He doesn't approach God casually. You know, so often, I, the way we approach God says a lot about who we are. We approach God so casually, like, God, I want this. Please give it to me. And yet, we don't acknowledge we're talking to the God of the universe. That's what this guy realizes. He sees where he is, and he sees where God is. And he is honest with God. God, I'm not even worthy. Turn your anger, turn your wrath away from me. I know I deserve it, but I'm going to trust that you can take that from me. Help me. I am a sinner. He's just blunt with God. He's just, he lays it out there. He doesn't hide anything. He knows he's been greedy. He's been collecting money from these people, and keeping it for himself. He doesn't pretend like his life is good. He doesn't try to hide his greed or selfishness. Think about it. What good does it do to try to hide from God anyway? What, is, what good would it be to, to try to hide these things from him? God already knows. Look at Psalm 193, or 139. Let me read that. Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. It's God's word. He knows it all. He knows the truth about this tax collector. And so the tax collector is honest about it. Do we know ourselves well enough to be honest with God? Do we know our own hearts well enough? That's the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector has had the wool pulled away from his eyes, and he sees himself as he really is. The Pharisee refuses to acknowledge his own weaknesses, his own sins. Where are we? Are we really being honest with God today? Are we trying to pretend like everything's okay? God wants us to realize that only when we're honest with Him about where we are in our lives and who we are and our real struggles, our real issues, only then can He help us. Only then can He change us. <clears throat> Be honest with God. And so that leads us into a, kind of our second thing that we see here that marks true people of God. Not only do we need to be honest with God about where we are, we need to recognize in our honesty what we deserve. <laughs> We need to recognize what we deserve. What do these two men think they deserve from God? Pharisee. He thinks he deserves God's favor. He thinks he deserves God's respect. <clears throat> he thinks he deserves heaven. Look at all I've done, God. I deserve these things. I can't wait for the rewards you're going to give me. That's his mentality. And... and, and uh, he doesn't recognize that every bad thing he's done is an offense to God. And God can't stand for those things. He, he, all he really deserves 
is, is judgment, and he doesn't know it. But then we look at the tax collector, and it's the opposite. He doesn't expect anything from God. Did you see that? He, he stands far off. Turn your wrath from me, a sinner. Only thing he thinks he deserves is God's wrath, God's anger. This is a completely different view of God. One thinks he deserves everything good from God. One thinks he deserves everything bad from God because of who he is. These people are miles apart in their thinking. So the question for us today is, what do you, what do you think you deserve from God for your life? If you were to stand before God today, and, and God tells you to plead your case before Him, what, what would you say you deserve from Him? God, I deserve heaven because I have done these good things for people. I'm a great person. Really? God tells us that if we have done even one wrong thing, then we deserve His judgment. Because God is holy. And He is perfect. It changes our thinking a little bit. I don't think any of us would say that we've never done anything wrong. If you have, I need to talk with you. I need some tips. All right? <laughs> and so, where do you stand? What do you think you deserve from God? When we think about that, it shapes how we live. If we think we deserve good things from God, then we're going to live with a sense of arrogance, a sense of pride, that, that, a sense of entitlement. That not only does God owe us, all these other people owe us too because we are just good people. If we think we deserve God's rain, wrath and anger, that is a humbling thing to know that we stand as people who deserve punishment. I mean, that, that's humbling. We don't feel like we deserve anything from anybody. And we know that there's something wrong in our life and it needs fixing. And we need forgiveness. It's a humbling thing to know that you need forgiveness from somebody. So that leads us kind of to the third, to the third point here. Not only do we need to be honest with God, not only, not only do we need to recognize what we deserve, God gives us a solution. And that is we have to humbly ask God to forgive us. You know, it does no good to, to know where we stand, to know our sin, to know what we deserve, and just stay there. We can't just stay there. No, it does no good to have head knowledge and not do anything about it. For the Pharisee, he, he doesn't have any room for forgiveness. There's no need for that in his life. For the tax collector, he is desperate for God's forgiveness, and he pleads for it. He begs for it. His relationship with God is broken, and the only way to fix it is for him to be forgiven. You all know how this plays out in life. Have you all ever been in a situation where you need forgiveness from somebody? Ever? You know, it, it, when two people fight, it, imagining that that kind of thing happens, and not that I'm speaking from experience, when two people fight, whether spouses or, or neighbors or family members, the, the relationship is broken at that point, right? There's a, a divide between two people. And the only thing that can fix that divide is an acknowledgement of a wrong done and a forgiveness given. So for, I'm going to tell myself for a minute, uh, a while back, you know, I'm finishing up seminary, so I'm studying quite a bit, and I go upstairs and kind of shut the door to study. And 30 minutes later, my wife comes up, comes in the room to get something, and I've got the football game on. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> All right, the the trust has been broken. <laughs> Forgiveness is needed. There's a relationship broken there, and so the only thing that's going to fix that broken relationship is an acknowledgement of a wrong on my part for you know not being honest with what I was doing, and a willingness of her to forgive me for the, for doing that, and so. Uh, that's that's what's that's what's at stake, and so fortunately, you know, we were able to to get that worked out. I admitted I shouldn't have turned on the football game. I should have kept on studying, and she was willing to eventually <laughs> <laughs> overlook that. But uh, you know, that's that's where we stand with God. We don't realize that one sin breaks that relationship with God. 
And we have to acknowledge it. We have to be honest about it. But then we also have to be willing to seek God's forgiveness in it. Now, how often in life have we, do we know uh, we've offended someone or we've sinned against someone and yet we can't swallow our pride and ask for forgiveness? It's that way with God, too. A lot of times we know we've done things that God doesn't like. And yet we don't want to acknowledge that before God. We don't want to ask Him to forgive us because that means we have to admit we're wrong. We have, we have to admit it. We can't just be content in our relationship with God knowing that we've sinned. We have to take the next step to deal with it. And that is, seek God's forgiveness. Do you realize today that God's forgiveness is available to you? That in His mercy, He has made forgiveness possible through sending His Son to die on a cross for you. Do you realize that? Do you realize the relationship that you break with God when you sin can be healed from His forgiveness? Look what happens when we do ask for forgiveness. Look at verse 14 in the story. I tell you, this one, this tax collector went down to his house justified because he humbled himself. God is exalting him and forgiving him because he humbled himself enough to be willing to admit, God, I need your forgiveness. I have sinned. That's the result. He's justified. He's declared right. Even though he is not right, God declares him right. This is God's offer of mercy and grace to us today. And it only comes through being honest with God. It only comes from recognizing we deserve nothing but God's wrath and anger. But then it also comes when we're willing to trust God and place those things before Him and allow Him to forgive us. So as we take a step back and think about this passage, there's really kind of four types of people that this parable really addresses. Four types of people. So kind of think about which category you might fit in. First, you have the Pharisee. You have the Pharisee who you have sin in your life, but up to this point, either you couldn't see it or you weren't willing to acknowledge it. <coughs> Maybe you're blinded by the, own, your, the good things you've done. So God is, today, maybe God is trying to make that clear to you. That you have done things that have offended God. That you are in need of Him. God is calling you today to recognize that and to trust Him with your life. To trust Him for forgiveness of your sin. That's the first person. The Pharisee who, whose sins have been laid bare to them. Who they now see that. The second person is a tax collector. But unlike this tax collector, you actually still like your sin. You know you're a sinner and you like it. And you enjoy the, the things that come along with uh, living sinful lives. Um, you think you're okay in spite of it, but God wants you to know today that you're not okay. Don't keep living that life. It gets you nowhere in the end. It leads straight to a place that we call hell. It may be fun for the moment, but in the end, it's going, it's going to be a bad situation. Something has to be done about this. Jesus wants you to know He died for that sin. And He offers you a better life. Something much more meaningful, such, something much more lasting than just the fleeting sins of this world. He wants you to trust Him to take care of it. And the third person that we see here is Maybe you were that tax collector, and you have trusted Christ for forgiveness, but over time you've kind of lost concern over your sin. Yeah, you may uh, acknowledge that you've sinned. You may acknowledge that you have issues in your life, but it's just kind of this generic thing. Like, I know I sinned, but you don't really take it that seriously. We have to be reminded be reminded of the, the links that God went to for you. Don't just think of, of sin as some generic thing. Think about specific sins you've done in your life this past week. Be reminded that God sent His Son to die for those. And when you are, it changes you. It brings you to Him. And 
changes your life. You want to live for Him because of this sin that I did this week. This way that I looked at that person. This attitude I had toward a family member. Christ died for that. When you realize that, it changes you. So don't, don't be like the tax collector who does this and then forgets about what, what's happened. Continually be reminded of, of your sin and Jesus dying for it. The fourth person we see is somebody who is saved, the tax collector, but now they feel like they're in the pit. They think their sin is so bad that they can't be forgiven anymore. 1 John 1 9 reminds us that if you confess your sins and ask for God's forgiveness, He is faithful to forgive you your sin and make you right with God. Purify you from all unrighteousness. All it takes is a confession of your sin and a trust in Him. No sin is too bad. <clears throat> Do that today. My prayer is that you would find which category you fit in and let God draw you to Himself. And that we would all adopt this mindset of this tax collection where we would humble ourselves on a regular basis before God and allow Him to change us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this picture of these two men and what a difference it is. And what a difference it is in our lives that you make when we humble ourselves before you, when we are honest with you, God, with where we stand. That's all you want. You just want us to, to recognize who we are before you. That we have our faults, that we have our sins. And that we need to address those things in our life. And that you have made a way to. <coughs> God, I pray today if there is any in this room who have not dealt with sin in their life. <coughs> that today would be that day. That they would realize that you offer forgiveness and eternal life. If they would trust in you. If they would just be honest with you and lay those things before you. God, for those of us who have kind of glossed over the sin in our life and don't take it as seriously as you think we should or tell us we should. Lord, that today we would we'd take that seriously, that we would be reminded that you have died for those things and that that would draw us closer to you, to a greater relationship with you, a greater reliance on you, a greater love for you. Father, we do a work in our hearts today and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.